That's excellent visibility. And it's almost like this portion of the wreck lies in a trench where the mud was pushed up perhaps by the impact. Yeah, it's a trench made by itself. And then uh, the wreck falls away a little bit and opens a trench between the hull and the slope there. Do you know what the identifying characteristic of this is as versus the Soryu? Uh, well, the length is a big one because it's about 100 feet longer. The casemate <laughs> guns, the size of the uh, venting stack, and the name at the start. Yeah, we were surprised to see the name, pleasantly surprised to see the Akagi. I also want to personally thank you for the hard work. I've spent a lot of time at sea. I know these glorious moments that we get to celebrate with distinguished guests are the culmination of many hundreds and hundreds of hours of hard work, of survey, of getting the tech right, the engineering right. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you for everything you all are doing. And I look forward to being able to share the, the imagery that we've got right now, as well as some of the stories that uh, everyone has to tell with the guests that are gathering here in Silver Spring. Thank you. Uh, back over to you. Thank you very much. Yeah, this piece, this curved piece that's yeah. bent outwards, John on the science chat was thinking it was either decking flopped outwards or top. I'm not sure what that is. Yeah, it's Just strange. Like it, it doesn't have room to fit like adjacent to and against the, the barbette. Right. And there wasn't, or was there a lip? Maybe it was vertical and the it was poking out over it? Either that or it's pushed up. Yeah, it and could it's be. bent down, but I don't know what that curve would be. Thank you, John. He's pointing out that it's looking like it's the bulge at the water line and we're very low down. And looking at the diagram, one of the reference diagrams we have in cross section, significant part of the upper superstructure is gone. Whereas yesterday we're looking at the Akagi's flight deck, albeit, you know, a massively damaged and mostly missing flight deck, at least that level was there. Here we simply are not seeing that upper level at all. Can we zoom in the interior? Yeah, that's what Ed was talking about a minute ago. He said... I don't like, think that's a ladder. I it's not it's a ladder. It's uh, just a frame of okay. something yeah. else. Oh, there's an anemone. It was actually on the hull. It probably thinks it's special. It does. And what about this line that's running horizontally from left to right with a break right at this point? Is that a degaussing line? It could be one of my favorite features of degaussing wire. A lot of times those degaussing wires are in, in parallel, two or three, around the whole ship. But this is single, but maybe that is what it is. It's also underneath the portholes, which isn't really where that would, would have been. Yeah it's, yeah, it's generally pretty low down, but... Yeah, we're probably at the lowest level anyway. That's nice and clear. Yeah. I'm going to say we're right around five meters away. Yeah, that's a good spot. Uh, Mike or Hans, can y'all remind us of what kind of damage Kaga took on? I know that it was scuttled um, with torpedoes, I'm assuming, but were there bombs like what we were talking about with Akagi? Oh yeah, definitely. In the confusion of battle, it's, it's hard for pilots to always confirm whether they have a hit or a near miss, but mm -hmm. uh, ultimately when putting together all those reports and, and first-hand evidence, we're looking at you know a number of bombs that struck the flight deck. The Kaga was hit early, and there are maybe four, 500 bombs uh, that struck the deck, and a 1,000 pound bomb as well. So multiple direct hits on the flight deck, igniting the fires, damaging the fire suppression system, wreaking havoc, wow. really terrible fires. If you've been following us for the previous two dives, you'll already know this, but if anyone is new to this uh, tuning in just for today, we're on a single body that's attached to the ship with a cable and some of the heave that the ship experiences at the surface is translated down that cable, which is why our, our camera is moving up and down. Yeah, Sebastian just pointed out something to me that uh, on the diagram of the bomb hits, and if we are where we think we are, it might be hard to say if the bomb hit did this or subsequent explosions continued the damage further down to these lower decks. We're so low that we're, we might be looking at the engineering spaces at the very bottom of the ship. Hey, Nautilus, do you see some of the curvature there on that? on that combing just in the center of view. I mean, I mean, is that, is that possible? It could be part of a shaft or is it just kind of 
plating that's been bent over just in that perfect arc. I think I think I think it's hull plating that's bent bent over into the interior. It seems connected to the exterior. Got it. Great. That was a thought from um, Frank Thompson at Naval History and Heritage Command. Mike, the uh, inboard part of this piece looks like it's bent up and back towards it, so I can try and get a zoom if we tilt up. Sure. Yeah. Guys, I think what we're looking at um, with the uh, six holes in there, I th uh, John and I think that's the base of the five-inch sponson, which uh, is a word he's uh, recently taught me. That was one of the supports for um, one of the gun tubs uh, that would have been uh, higher up from here. Sponson, I hadn't heard that word before. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to chime in real quick and say that this is the highest density of the white anemones we've seen across all three racks is under this bed piece hole. And it's funny they're so dense on the uh, underside. Hey, hey Nautilus, a uh, quick thought on that uh, mount just uh, just forward of where we are. So that flange that we're seeing with the bolt pattern we think might be one of the supports for the port side artillery mount, um, probably number six. Um, and uh, there's a, a couple of angles were used to bear that up the side of the gunnel. And we think that we're seeing just the very bottom section of that uh, where the, um, where the, sorry, the 12, the 12, 7, yeah. Oh yeah, where the 12.7 centimeter anti-aircraft gun would have been mounted. So we're, we're right at the base, we think, uh, of where that, where that uh, mount was. There it is, Roger, thank you, short side. Is are we looking at the correct support here in the visual? Yeah, correct. Yeah, that's correct. And you can see how it's paired in below that bracket. Yes. You can see in the, the plans that we're looking at, um, there's an angle right there above the line where the portholes are. Yes. So I think we're, I think the top is sheared off, but it's just that bottom section. I think it's the number eight um, artillery. Or, I'm sorry, number six. There's still is that a gun? The... Absolutely. That is the casemate gun. Yep, one of 10 20 centimeter casemate guns carried very low down towards the waterline, remnant of the design of the original battleship hull. Phil or anyone on the archaeology team, could you explain for us a casemate gun and what makes it different from the others? Casemates are certainly heavier guns that were lower in the waterline and are, are remnants from the older naval strategies that were used in ship-to-ship -ship combat designed to pierce holes of other vessels. Um, they were encased, they were protected, they were armored, and they represent often some of the largest armaments of battleships and, in this case, aircraft looks carriers. looks like another intact gun. Just, uh... Right, thank you, Phil. It's, it's clear that, you know, this is designed to be a ship-to-ship -ship weapon rather than the kind of anti-aircraft weapons we were looking at higher up for aircraft carriers, which could often be elevated to 90 degrees. Yeah, and, and what makes it casemate is it's mounted on the hull rather than on the deck like it would be for a battleship or destroyer. I wonder, is that another mount for a casemate and we're missing one? I think it is. It looks to me like roller bearings. Yeah. Yeah, that's where they, one of the casemate guns was there. Is that what we're seeing upside down there? No. It's no, it's just that's shape. the mount where the turret was. Yeah. I can't really make out if there's another one down there or not. Yeah, it's possible. Do they have that... a domed top on these yeah. semicircles? Yeah. We don't actually know. I mean, other versions were, of course, but we don't know if uh, either Kaga or Akagi ever actually fired them outside of practice because mm -hmm. they were never, they're aircraft carriers. They weren't doing ship to ship yeah. firing. I think they just kept them here because they were already installed when they yeah. were a, a cruiser in a battleship hull. I don't think they were really ever... Right. I don't know, they may not have even carried ammunition for them. I mean, they, mm -hmm. they weren't ever intending to be, and they were never attacking ship to ship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my guess would be they, they weren't used in the Battle of Midway at all. The vessels never saw each other. Yeah. The Nautilus, short side. Yeah. We have a special guest with us. Would you uh, take a few moments Say hello to Admiral Sam Cox from Navy History and Heritage Commander, the director. 
Absol absolutely. Hi, uh, Admiral Cox. It's uh, it's good to have you here. Hey, uh, I, I just wanted to say thank you for the, the work that you're doing here. This is uh, absolutely awesome. Uh, yeah, I had the opportunity to be on Petrol when we found the lot. But this is this is uh, this is just amazing. I think we'll we'll learn things that we didn't know before, uh, and certainly it's an opportunity to get this out to the American public. Uh, so that they can understand what, you know, our Navy has done for them in the past uh, and also understand the valor and sacrifice, you know, on both sides uh, in battle, which was, which was pretty incredible. So I just want to say thanks for the great job that you're doing. Uh, thank you so much for saying that and, uh, and, and thanks for uh, coming by and, and watching. Yeah, thank you, Admiral. We, we couldn't agree more. There's important historical and archaeological information here that tells the story and allows us to understand these sites as they change over time. But we're very aware of the, f the nature of this, this violent conflict that occurred and the loss of life and uh, are as respectful as we can to, to honor those who were lost. These are hallowed sites deserving of the same respect that in the United States we would give to Arlington National Cemetery. You know, these sailors have no headstones because at sea, uh, and this is a memorial to their sacrifice and uh, deserves to be treated uh, with the utmost respect on you know, both Japanese and American. Uh, none of these sailors had any choice in having to go to war, and they all did their duty. And, uh, you know, we just need to respect that. And I appreciate that uh, you're carrying on in that manner. Nautilus, short side. Go yeah, go ahead. Uh, so how, how, how is, how is that? <laughs> <laughs> simple question, but uh, how do you feel now? That's uh, a very wonderful time, I guess. And we're we're looking at the the empty barbette where one of the casemate guns used to be, uh, and we're going to be making our way very slowly along the starboard side towards the bow and documenting um, the battle damage and the damage from sinking and how it's uh, settled into the mud and looking for um, just to see the general condition uh, of this wreck. Right. Mike and Hans, one of the things that I think would probably be important for you to relay is just what we were talking about, which is the sense that everybody has had on this wreck as well as Akagi and Yorktown. Well, well, first of all, this is an, an incredibly special mission to have the capacity to do. There's a wealth of information here to understand this pivotal battle, but to be honest with you, and, and I think I speak for some others as well, it's not an easy thing to see these sites because, in a sense, seeing what's happened to these shipwrecks, we're reliving some of the, of the violence of the conflict and the catastrophic engagement that was the Battle of Midway. And I can tell you for myself, you know, it's, uh, it brings up a lot of feelings beyond the mission time frame itself. It will take me some time to deal with, frankly. It's very sobering. And we understand we're looking at locations where sailors and airmen lost their lives almost instantaneously sometimes. And so it's, it's important that we honor that and remember that. And the cultural protocols and the staff we have on board to help us understand the larger meaning of this place, Papahanao Mokuakea, is helping me to deal with some of those feelings. So there's a sadness to these sites. They're very striking. And I don't think any of us will ever forget them. That's a good point about the dynamic nature of the maritime battlefield. It is a battlefield nonetheless, but it's an unseen battlefield for the most part, until now, until technology like this. Oh, I see the possible torpedo site was actually further, further left than I thought. Um, yeah, yeah, but I don't, <laughs> there was that, I don't know if you want to go that deep into the wreck, do you, or you want to no, stay more on the edge? Yeah, let's stay on the edge, so yeah, that that looks decent there. All right, maybe we'll do, let's do yeah. eight, 80 meters at 230. Hey, there it is right there, that's the torpedo damage, just on the right, wow. You guys nailed it. Well yep. done. Yep. Good job, Jake. It's pretty much the exact spot, Mike. Yep. That's all Derek. 
That's great. Jake, Jake set me saved on that last bearing. I appreciate that. That's, um, I was worried we weren't going to find it again. That's awesome. That's really exceptional navigating, guys. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. We dropped a mark on this spot? Yeah, yep. Yeah, we did. That's right, to get back to it. Russ is asking if the deck has collapsed beyond that area of damage. I uh, can't quite tell right now. What we're not seeing is what's below. Yeah, I thought I saw it collapse forward of this plate. So we'd be forward of midships. Yeah. And uh, on the sonar scan from 2019, looking down on it on the starboard side, forward of midships, you can see some large voids dark spots on top towards the uh, the hull, close to where we are right now. Maybe, just maybe those coincide with the location where we're at. I, uh, okay, I, uh, my guess is that we're kind of right under where the uh, tower was. Yeah, Russ is saying that at the top of the screen, it looks like the deck has collapsed into a V shape, which makes sense if there was such damage here. Again, we'll, we'll know more when we get a little closer and when we go past and we can look back the other direction and see the extent of it. Yeah, could be a little dodgy coming up ahead. Yeah. I mean, just from the, the breadcrumb trail of points we've left as we moved around with the vehicle, it does look like this part of the hull is definitely kind of smashed in from the rest. Oh, that's interesting, yeah. So it might come back out as we move towards the bow. Yeah. All right, I think we should probably put in another move. Um, yeah, let's, uh, we can almost lateral, but we can move a little bit closer too. You want to keep that same 265 bearing? Yeah, that works. Yeah. Take a quick peek here while we're hanging out. Yeah, go for zoom. There is a uh, round object bottom right. So what's interesting is that those lines don't have any anemones on them, like every other line we've seen. I'm there. Oh, sorry. I'm trying to see if there's any rusticles maybe growing on that rope that might be prohibiting them from growing on it. Yeah. yeah it's something hanging down in the water column coming up to straight ahead. It's not yep. sticking up, though. It's hanging down. Think so. I know those anemones oh, like, like no, their I view. See. You, see, you mean like a plate, Ed? Yeah. Yeah, there's like a plate coming off the wreck. Yep. yep. I mean, you get a little glimpse down in that area that would normally be like a bosun's locker. Oh yeah, maybe. Please tell me there were paravanes on the foredeck. Paravanes? Did you see any paravanes? I was hoping to see them in the plans they're there, but they might not be. They look like kind of torpedoes with wings. I don't think so. Strapped down to the port of someone. I didn't see them. I didn't see them. I'll try and zoom on right here if I can. Yep, over zoom. Just a discoloration. It's weird. Oh, it's a uh, cover, like a service cover or something. What is that? There you go. No weird. Uh, it looks like a cover you would remove to access electronics or looks something. looks plastic, which they didn't have. No, it looks like a water bottle from very wide, but that oval is a um, an access panel. It's a poignant moment. Yeah. It really is. These have been some remarkable and unforgettable and, and sometimes difficult glimpses of the past it's a it's um certainly a I, i'm not even sure what the word is but it's a powerful thing to see how much destruction you know can be wrought on something um you know in, I, I think in a day in a day and i think and you know this is just a glimpse at some of those moments and uh it's important to you know study them and remember them because 
you know, we're trying to hope that such instances don't have to happen again. Um, you know, and, and fortunately, the, the U.S. and Japan have become great allies out of this. You know, that's not how every conflict ends. So, you know, you know, a, a, an alliance rose out of the ashes of, of things that happened 80 years ago, which is which is nice to see. Agreed. Ew. Ew.